Um, I also really think it was a diamond move and a generous move to donate uh, all the profits from your YouTube videos to... Uh, well, tell me, what, what did you donate it to? So, you know, as a bit of context, when you have YouTube channel workouts or you've got a YouTube channel, you know, you can put adverts on and then YouTube will pay you like a little bit of revenue from that. So I've never, it's never been a massive part of my business. I'm not a YouTuber. Like I've got an online fitness business and I've got my cookbooks and, and whatnot. And so when Nikki said to me, Joe, like we've had 20 million views in five days and he told me the analytics and we looked at the number because it tells you the exact amount, you, you know, you raise through the revenue and the number's massive. I'm, I, I haven't announced it. I mean, I could... If you want an exclusive, a world exclusive, I'll tell you what it's on now. Anyway, the number's massive, and I didn't... Yeah, I want a world exclusive. I do want world exclusives. Do you want to know? You, well, first of all, the number's massive, the views have been insane, and I didn't want people to think for a second that I did this to benefit financially. So I said, look, let's donate the money we raised from all of these videos from the start of this campaign. The lo it's not... There's no advert when it's live, but when they go back and watch it, there's a little advert that pops up. So... You know, when that revenue comes in from every video from now until the end of time, until I'm, you know, I'm still doing these videos, 100% is going to go to the NHS because, you know, I love the NHS. I went to Kingston Hospital, you know, I had Indy and Rosie, were, sorry, Indy and Marley were born there. I went there the other day because I fell off my bike, they fixed me wristlet and they're, <laughs> they're struggling, mate. It's hard, it's hard work down there and they, I don't need that, I don't need that money and I, I feel better, I, I feel happy and I'm proud that I'm giving to NHS and it weren't even a tough decision but mate in the past seven days alone the estimated revenue is $85,000 just on six videos how that's mad is amazing. that that's mental well so done. you're the only person that you're the only person that knows that only me and Nikki know that I haven't because I don't want anyone to you know I, it might not continue at that I didn't want to say oh it's going to be this much money but every single penny 100% of it's going to go to one of the NHS charities and, and I'm proud of that because now it means everyone that does a video whether they go back in six months or you know six six weeks or whatever they that revenue is going to go back into the NHS system and I'm, I'm well happy with that mate it's amazing it's going to be mad the number's going to be bonkers mate it's, it's incredible it's brilliant it's already a fantastic achievement it's brilliant that you're doing it and it's uh, the icing on the cake not that a cake is the sort of thing that you'd be peddling you fitness guru no, you. I love a cake I love a cake <laughs> you're so sweet. carrot cake I'm a bit of a carrot cake man it's a, it's a really brilliant thing that you've done there and it's made me think um, like cause we do stuff on YouTube as well and we've been talking about who should we who should we give it, it to if there's any profit we're not watched by anything like the number of people that watch your stuff but like uh, I'm, I'm thinking maybe we should think of mental health or addiction aspects of the NHS to make a donation to so you've not only have you done all that good yourself you've also made me think about it and inspired me to think oh yeah yeah I could do that so thanks yeah, mate, do it. I mean, it's wonderful, isn't it, to know that you know it's going somewhere that's going to be going to be useful and whatever's whatever's dear to you. I was trying to think of a global charity so that everyone around the world would feel like they're donating, but I thought you know majority of the views are coming from the UK, and ultimately, like you know, the NHS are amazing at the moment and they're they're working so hard. But I I just I just can't believe the support. It's been amazing. So thank you to everyone that has tuned in and and watched those videos. And um, you know, thanks again for helping me grow it and share it. And just for the just for the record, like. I've never made that much money on YouTube. It's not like that, and it will drop. You know, it won't. It's not like a revenue stream that's going to be like forever. But while I'm doing this, and there's all this attention, everyone's doing these views. That's why that number's so big. It will not be like forever. I'm not going to be like, you know, breaking the bank every month on YouTube because it's not what I, uh, my money. You know, it's not where I earn my money from. Yeah, no, nice one. It's a brilliant thing that you've done. It's a, and it's also I think it creates a lot of optimism. How are you dealing with being at home with your kids and that, mate? How's that going? Yesterday was the first day it's got to me and I, I, I was honest about it, you know, I'm trying to be a great dad, I'm trying to come down and do the breakfast and cook dinner and trying to keep the house tidy and then I'm trying to do all the interviews and, and the workouts, so it's just tough when you've got two babies, like when you've got the first one and they cry, you pick them up instantly, there's no crying, you can just soothe them, Where, but when you've got one and you've got one rolling around in, the, in a pooey nappy and you've got to try and get the other one's milk ready, it's, it's, it's really, it's mend I think... I think that the most, the most challenging thing mentally for any human being is two screaming babies at once when you're on your own and you're trying to, trying to calm and settle them. It's the most intense thing ever because you go from being super calm to bang 100% and they're screaming in your face and in my head, I'm just screaming, just please just leave me alone. But I have to take a breath and like, like you might know this, you can practice patience and you can practice tolerance and I'm I'm learning to train that muscle so that I can have a breath and pause and 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 before I vocalize and that's helped me a lot because 
I've learned to stay really calm even when Indy's having a real meltdown. If we're on a plane or on a bus or we're somewhere public, I'm just learning to be calm. And when I was a kid, trust me, my mum was screaming and shouting at me. It wasn't like that. So my default setting is to just go, shut up, leave me alone. But I'm training my mind because otherwise you'll be screaming at each other and you just make it worse. You've got to be calm. You have to show emotional control because this is one thing I've learned. A baby does not have a rational brain. No matter how much you want them to, they don't understand that you're trying to make them breakfast. They just give me that breakfast, I need it now. Whereas I have to le learn to be calm and I'm really, I'm really practicing that with Indy and I'm trying to set a good example to you know, with Rosie and Marley as well. Yeah, I find the same thing. That's hard, isn't it? Because, because sometimes, like, especially our three-year-old, she's quite articulate and smart. So you start to think, oh, she's like a, just a little adult. But she ain't. She's not got a fully formed rational brain. I'm 44 and some would argue that I still don't have one. So that kid sometimes, like, I, I really want to, like, go, to, I want it the same as you. I want to go, just shut up, shut up. <laughs> I want to have full-blown Yeah, leave me alone her. just for five minutes. Yeah, but you can't, can you? Because, like, you know, sometimes, yeah, sometimes whether it's like they want food or like, and sometimes, what about this? Sometimes they won't actually tell you what it is they want. Like, they're just, uh, like, being unhappy. And I'm like, what what, act what do you want? Tell me, I'll go and get it. And they won't So won't Indy's new me. thing, Indy's new thing is she just goes, Daddy, Daddy, Joe, Joe. She's learned my name. She goes, Joe. <coughs> and she'll scream and shout, and I go, yeah, what, darling? Uh... Oh, I'm okay. And then she'll be like, strawberries, give her strawberries. Then she's asking for her mum. So it is tough. But like I said, my default setting is to be impatient and be snappy and intolerant because it's what I learned from my dad and my mum. It's all I ever learned. And so for me, I'm working on it. I'm working on it every day. And sometimes I'm not perfect, but you, you can choose. You have the ability to choose how you react to a stressful situation. You can have a meltdown, scream and shout and see them get more upset. Or you can just say, right, she just wants her food. She doesn't understand that I'm trying to keep things quiet and have a nice, you know, peaceful dinner. It just doesn't work. Like, so you have to get down on their level and just calm your breath for a second. And I don't meditate, but when that happens, I literally, I feel myself going, I go, <laughs> and I take a moment and I go, are you right, Indy? What's the matter, darling? What can I help you with? Well, you're good, aren't you? Listen, why don't you meditate? I've tried, mate. I tried doing the Calm app. I tried doing Headspace and I'm sitting there and like Bev got me on it as well and we tried to do it. Me and Bev tried to do like a seven day meditation challenge and it's so funny because she's like me, loves being busy, always on it, always, you know, emailing and working and, and kind of productive. And I'd sit and I'd go, Bev, I've given up. I can't get past day three. And she goes, yeah, don't worry, darling, me too. What we, we, we accepted was we are mindful that we can't be mindful. And so me, my meditation is exercise. Like when I'm, I'm sitting there, I'm sitting, I'm just breathing and I'm trying to, I'm like, oh, I could be doing better stuff. I could be excellent. What? And so my brain's racing and I've tried and tried to slow it down. And I'm the fidgety guy in yoga. I'm the guy twitching and I'm the guy like moving about. And you're like, come on, chill out, get rid of him. He needs to do dynamic stuff. That's so interesting. Like, but see that paralysis dream right now. Look, of course I'm going to come like, you know, when I, when I was your age, I've barely given up smack. So I can hardly <laughs> criticize you for not meditating <laughs> two hours a day. But like, my point is that, um, that I think that everyone would benefit from a spiritual dimension to their life. You've already said, like, in this conversation, mate, things like, there's a voice inside me that says, keep going, keep going. You've said that you've got this energy and this purpose and this drive. You said that you recognize it's more important to be of service to other people than to, uh, you know, than to profit yourself or to grow yourself. All these things are sort of spiritual ideas that you are individually discovering. And, and another idea that sits alongside them is a practice of meditation. And, and it's not for anyone to tell anyone else you know, what their spiritual practice should be. But like the advantage of sort of, uh, say, mantra meditation or breath meditation as opposed to uh, the more dynamic things that come easily to you is precisely the opportunity to get beyond that thinking. Because like me, like anyone, when I first sit down to meditate, I'm like, you know, I sit down and I'm thinking, oh, no, I can't be bothered to do this. I, I want to move around. I start remembering things from the past, projecting things from the future, thinking of different ideas. But what I was taught by, um, I, I learned meditation off Bobby Roth from the David Lynch Foundation, and they'd happily teach you meditation, mate, I tell you that now. You return to the mantra, right? You don't judge yourself for thinking, the mind does think. 
But what like doing the like returning to the mantra starts to show you is that we are not our thoughts. We are the awareness that houses our thoughts. And it makes you, a lot of things you've already spoken about, about the capacity of exercise to re- release, uh, you know, dopamine and serotonin. You start to realize that there's some larger system that's housing the identity, that's housing the thoughts, that's housing even anatomy itself. And there's a real peace, and, and I think that, you know, it's mad for me to be even, I'm not, I'm not offering you advice, I'm just having a conversation because you're obviously doing no, very, listening, very well. No, I'm listening, I'm listening, I need to hear this, go on, I need to hear it. Well, I feel like, you know, you're a person that's very, very interested in self-improvement and awakening, and I also feel like there was one bit where you just sort of went, I'm not spiritual, and then you adjusted it to not religious, and I feel like that spirituality, this time of coronavirus, this time of global lockdown, is a time where people are going to have to look at what what our priorities are on an individual level and a collective level. We've learned that it is possible to change the way we travel, the way we communicate, the way we interact. And my sense is, without wanting to take us into choppy political waters, that post-coronavirus, there'll be one side of the argument that's about maintaining control measures. And there'll be another side of the argument that's like, hey, we learned some interesting stuff during that time. We learned some things about ourselves, And I think that... If someone like you was to get into meditation, I think it would have a, a big impact, I think, on you individually. I think you'd start to discover latent uh, potency and power within yourself. And I think also anything that you're enthusiastic about will catch on like wildfire. So I'd really, really like to encourage I'd- you to try it. Yeah, no, I, listen, I'm hearing you and I do, I totally agree. And I, my brother, Nicky's practicing meditation and we work together, you know, symbiotically in a sense that we're so switched on all the time. We're so engaged with our community. And my dad's a big, you know, he does a lot of yoga and meditation and constantly trying to, it's like me trying to say, Russell, eat health, you're going to feel great. Go and exercise, mate. You're going to feel, you're going to love it when you're anxious and depressed. Go and exercise. And I'm hearing that from you and I just need to take it on board and give it another go. But I, I know I know the value of it and I really do want to get into that mindset. I, I, I follow a lot of people that do meditate and promote it and I just, I've just i never just had that time to sit and like you said, it's about practice, it's about giving it another go and I'll, I'll take that on board, mate, and this week I think I need it more than ever. I'll, I'll have a little session, I'll sit down and do some, but talking about spirituality and stuff and that question of looking inside, I've, I have really weird, deep thoughts about my life on earth and my existence and I, I can sit there, just be talking with Rose and I'll go, why am I here? Like, what are we doing? How am I here? And I zoom out and my brain zooms out and I see the earth. Then I see the galaxy and I'm like, I get really confused. And I've started asking myself, am I doing enough? Like, is what I'm doing enough? A- am I generous enough? Am I g- too greedy with food? Like, am I kind enough? I'm I- li- literally since, since this pandemic thing even more because I walked down the high street and all the shops were closed and I was like, why do I need another pair of trainers? Why am I thinking, oh, I wish I could go in that shop? Why do I need more money in the bank? And I'm, so I'm asking myself all these questions, but because I don't know the answer to it, I, I find myself getting confused about it. Do you ever have that where you think, what am I doing here? Yes, I do think that. And also I've contemplated and thankfully been taught the, what some of the answers to at least some of the easier questions you just posed were. The reason that you know we care about... We'll never enough. know though. We'll, we'll, we'll never truly know. Like We'll never know how it started and why we talk about the science and the, and, and the religion and stuff but we'll never know so you have to just keep moving forward don't you and just live in the now we might not know the like the the mind of god or what the moment of creation was other than from a physics perspective where they can trace you know certain uh, aspects of how the material universe began but to talk to address some of your points there mate like when you said why is it that we you know focus on consumerism and new pair of trainers or money it's not a coincidence we're born into a culture that tells you relentlessly that that is what you should be doing that success looks like a lot of money success looks like a lot of power success looks like domination success looks like more and more pairs of trainers or pairs of pairs of trousers or better constantly updated phones because this is how the systems that we live within sustain themselves. The more and more people that start to wake up as you are doing and start to question the value of consuming as the primary means for making yourself feel better, then those systems will start to break down. The more people that start to get their self-esteem from helping one another, from loving one another, from building community, from helping other people's kids, from looking outside of themselves, then it's going to be harder for 
transnational corporations and potentially oppressive and manipulative governments to maintain their power. So whilst, of course, like everyone else that's ever existed, I don't know the answer to the biggest questions in life, I do know why human beings have had their primal natures directed towards consuming. It's because the kind of civilizations that we live in require us to think like that. And you, mate, you're waking up in the pod. You're waking up in the cell and realizing, hang on a minute, this isn't really what I want. How much money do I need? And like, look, I go back and forth on that all the time. When I'm frightened, I feel like, oh, bloody hell, I need to be able to get myself an island somewhere. I need to be able to retreat from this madness. But when I feel close to what I call God, when I feel safe, when I feel protected, when I feel like I've got purpose, then I think I will be guided. I will be shown. You know, that force that's taken you from the kind of chaotic childhood that you described to being the world's PE teacher, that force is looking out for you and we can call it whatever we will. But I know, I know that there's more to it than just a, a set of rational decisions being made. I know that there's something carrying you. Do you think anything's going to change then? So I'm hearing you, but do you really think that people are going to change? Because, I, I, you know, is it just going to go back to normal and suddenly it's like we're, we're back in the shops, we're buying everything we need, we're overeating, we're, we're overindulging? Because I think people seem to think there's just an unlimited supply of everything. And now, more than ever, I've had this anxiety, and I'll, I'll use this word because I do feel anxious about it. I've got a baby, right? I've got Indian Marley, and I didn't used to think about where my food came from. I didn't think about how bananas got to me and how berries were picked and strawberries, like... But now I think about it and I think about how will the world look, how will the oceans look in 50 years time and Indian Mali will be around then, they're going to be alive and, and I'm starting to feel anxious, do you know what I mean about that, like about having kids and bringing them into the world because it don't seem to be slowing down, the population ain't slowing down, we ain't, we ain't changing our ways on the earth, we're doing more and more and so that, what, that frightens me, that's the only thing I can honestly say, I, it worry, I'm not scared of death, I'm scared of how the world will look when I'm gone for my kids. That's lovely. That'd be, that's a nice that's Do you nice think about quote. that? Is that, is that deep? Do you, have you ever thought about that? Of course I do, mate. I've got two young kids myself, and I, th I do wonder, like, what this epidemic has provided is a lot of time for reflection. A, a lot of people, of course, are really suffering both economically and medically, and there's a lot of fear, but also a, a lot of us are being given time, a little bit of respite to consider what, it, what are we doing with our lives? Because like you said, mate, I agree, Joe, we live as if these resources are infinite. Zaya Tong, this um, uh, science entertainment broadcaster that came on the show, she said, in this age of surveillance, we can watch everything except where our food comes from, where our energy comes from, and where our waste goes. Everything else you can look at on camera. Why is it that those things are excluded? Mostly because it would make us bulk. You know, the sort of same consumer impulse that we talked about before that makes us think about earning money and buying trainers, that same system requires that we don't think about hold on a minute what are the consequences now you know like prior to coronavirus climate change was a massive news cycle story everyone was banging on about it all the time of course they were and one of the few positives that's emerged from this situation as well as people reflecting is that you know that there's been some environmental positives that have come from it but like those of us that are parents and those of us that aren't parents because we are all part of the same lineage we're all part of the same spin uh, species we're all part of this planet the planet that i can see mapped out behind you there that's where every single thing that's ever described in history took place on this rock and it is limited there are limited resources so we do need a bit of of a tune in we do need to be aware like that like a lot of indigenous folk mate you know i've been like learning a little bit about this like the aboriginal people of australia australia they think in terms of someone explained to me seven generations they don't just think well what's good for me they think what's it going to be like for my kids 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 like where how are them guys going to be living you know we're part of that joe we don't want to just spend our lives accumulating money in sports shoes we want to contribute to the yes. prosperity of our planet yeah, and the thing that I find hard when I do have them moments and I think about it in depth is that it's all right for us. We are living in a developed country. We have sanitation. We've got water, food. We've got resources. We can live this amazing, comfortable life. But in, in you know, I went to um, I went to Sierra Leone. I've I've been to you know Asia and, and India, and I've seen how how they they want economic growth. They want to have an amazing life. They want to have all the things that we've got. So we're trying to tell them to slow down, right? And I I don't know if you follow the national. Do you follow the Nat Geo Instagram account? Oh no, I will do. The Nat Geo one. It's amazing. So the other day there was a video and it was I, it broke my heart. I was so upset when I saw it. It's a, it's a picture of someone dropping a plastic bag off a bridge into the river and it talks about how 
It's the river that leads to the Ganges, right? And it's completely decimated. There's no life. There's no fish. There's nothing. It's, it's irreversible. Like, and I, and I see that and I just, I can't help but be so upset and it's nothing I can do because I'm recycling. I'm doing my bit here, but there's people that don't have the resources. They don't have anywhere to throw their rubbish. They don't have anywhere to, to do that. So it's all going in the, in the rivers and the, in the oceans and that same river comes back to our ocean. It's not even like we're, we're, we're in that, we're in it together. And so when I see this stuff and I, you know, I follow Gre Greta Thunberg and all this and it just breaks my, it, it really breaks my heart. But what can I, what can I do other than do my bit right now here, you know? In my well, house. Mate, I suppose one thing we can do at this time of reflection is think about how we can continue to um, practice our own particular skills like you in the world of fitness, which I think you're increasingly practicing from a place of awakened spirituality and me with my constant oratory and gabbling on. We can think, is it possible for us to do what we do outside of the conventional systems of capitalist consumerism, i.e. ultimately what you and I do ends up being a business that we make money from and other people make money from. Now, as individuals, there's very little we can do, but the consequences of a planet full of individuals to some degree doing you know, as well as they can on the hierarchical structures we exist on, whether you're earning low wages, you know, flipping burgers, or you're earning high wages, chatting on the internet or training millions of people, we're contributing to a system that leads to, that requires continual growth, endless growth. Like the thing you said at the beginning, you can't have endless growth on a limited planet. But GDP, gross domestic product, um, requires continual ongoing profit always. And one of the consequences of that is every single decision that gets made has to be made with profit in mind. Like, so if it's like, let's, dis let's use these this kind of plastic because it's cheaper, they'll bloody use that kind of plastic. You know, that, let's dispose yeah. of things in this way. They'll dispose of things in that way. And whenever you are in doubt about something, Joe, I think about like, one of the things I do is think, who makes money from things being this way? Who benefits? Benefits from things being this way and the answer will always come to you mate but well, what can we do you and I can continue to awaken continue to have conversations like this and look for the opportunities because believe me the same way as the opportunity came for you to become the world's PE teacher other opportunities will come for you particularly if you're dedicated to awakening Are you all right mate you're getting tired little Joe Wicks no no I'm listening I'm, I'm, I'm listening intently mate and I I always, sometimes you say things that confuse me, but you've really, on this whole conversation, I've understood everything you're saying, and I, I've just, I'm, I'm listening, and I, and I just, I think it's amazing. I love the message you've got, and I, I feel the same. Like